There might be some stragglers after lunch, but we can get started slowly. Um, so thanks everybody for showing up to this panel today. I'm really excited to be here on stage with all of these subject matter experts. Um, I myself have learned so much just from talking to them and working on this, this research that we're about to talk about. So i um, really pleased to be here and to have the opportunity. I just flew into Bilbao earlier today after a lot of flight issues, but um, it's a beautiful city. I, it's so nice to be here and um, appreciate the language. The Basque language is not the same as the Spanish language. Um, so I'll just, give my, I'll just give myself a brief introduction and then we'll get into more of the meat of the, of the session. So I'm Anna Hermanson. I'm the ecosystem manager at LF Research. And I've been here, I've been at the LF for almost a year now. Um, I have a background in qualitative research and healthcare and uh, have also done work in the um, sustainability space. And um, uh, actually right when I started this, this job, um, there was an email in my inbox from Hillary talking about the uh, LS Sustainability Initiative. I don't think it was called that then, but we were, we were thinking about how we could um, map all of the LF projects and all the work that's been done in this community to the different sustainability goals. Um, and that has really led into a, a very grounded initiative that has a lot of people behind it um, providing their own expertise and um, perspectives on how the LF is supporting these really important initiatives out of the UN. So. Um, so to, to give a better introduction to the research, um, uh, we, we recently published a research report called Open Source for Sustainability. It came out last week. And in that report, we mapped out uh, the many different LF projects and how they map to the different 17 sustainable development goals. Um, our author also got into the, the value of these digital public goods, generally speaking, that the LF community creates and how these um, public goods really interact nicely with, with the work of the UN and the ethos of, of the UN and the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm here today with four, uh, as previously mentioned, subject matter experts, um, some of which were interviewed on the report, and they're going to provide their perspective on how um, their own work and their projects relate to the Sustainable Development Goals. and. Um, and what they what was kind of talked about in this report. Um, so just as a, a heads up, um, I, I'm hoping this conversation will be very fluid. There's a lot of content we could get into here, um, and we also want to leave some time for audience questions. So please um, keep those in mind. And if you're if you have a burning question, we could always get to it at that moment if it needs to be asked right away. Um, but yeah, we're, we're really happy to hear from the audience as well. Um, and I just have some questions on my laptop, which is why I might be looking at my screen. So um, why don't I pass it over? We'll start with Kate to do some introductions. Sure, thank you. Um, I'm Kate Stewart, and um, my focus at the Linux Foundation is uh, dependable embedded systems. And what do we need to do to use open source in places that it needs to be uh, maintainable, secure, um, safety, and you know, security, safety, and reliability, and things like that, which overlaps in this space quite a bit. Uh, one of the projects I've been working on uh, with most of my time at the LF is the Zephyr project. And the Zephyr project started with the recognition that the Linux kernel does not get smaller than a certain size and using a smaller than a certain set of resources. And when you have to be resource constrained, which a lot of the new uh, products are for sustainability reasons. Um, Zephyr lets you just build in exactly what you need and has, been, has goals for going up to best security profiles and then you know, looking at the safety areas which some of these are overlapping with. But in resource constrained situations, it's a efficient and effective solution for a lot of um, processing methods and doing things just at a bare level, bare metal level, as well as communicating with a lot of human stats. So that's kind of a little bit of my background of and why I care about from Zephyr. And so we'll talk more about some examples soon. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Uh, my name is Sumer Johal. I'm the uh, executive director of AgStack, which is a project of the Linux Foundation. Um, AgStack is a digital infrastructure 
for food and ag in open source and aims to achieve the same sorts of efficiencies and um, you know, really uh, multiplier effects in efficiency for the entire global food ecosystem that you know, the operating system Linux uh, created for computing back 30 years ago. Uh, so the idea behind AgStack was, comes from the fact that the world uh, you know, has a massively inefficient food supply. About 30% of our food is wasted. A third of the people in the world are hungry. Agriculture employs about 50% of the labor in the world. Let me repeat that. Half the labor force of the world is employed in agriculture. 70% of all fresh water is used in agriculture. And so uh, as we look at the triple threats of population growth, uh, you know, uh, climate change, and uh, geopolitical unrest and food insecurity, um, the need for uh, creating neutral, secure infrastructure to enable both digital creation of content and consumption of content at scale is imperative. So the digital public infrastructure piece of this is what AgStack aims to do. Uh, and some of our projects are public, uh, uh, public interest projects. Uh, many of them are now starting to become interesting for large private sector enterprises as well. So really excited to be on the stage with my esteemed colleagues. Great. Hi there. My name is Matt Sando. I've been working in finance for the last 25 years, uh, most of that in BNP Paribas Bank in, in risk management. And um, we, we looked at the, uh, the, the climate problem uh, from a finance perspective where there is, a, there is a huge need to accelerate financing towards the transition. So helping companies adapt to, uh, to, be, uh, to become decarbonized. And, um, and we looked at this problem and decided that much of that could be handled at the collaborative layer. So BNP Paribas, along with uh, Goldman Sachs, Allianz, and Amazon Web Services, and a few others, we founded OS Climate, which stands for Open Source Climate, and that sits under the LF umbrella as a member-driven nonprofit organization. And primarily, our, our mission then is to, is to collaborate across the research uh, community, industry, commercial data providers, uh, financial firms, in order to work on sort of three main um, layers. One is how do we construct tooling and data um, collections which will help us decarbonize in investment portfolios. Um, the second piece is how do we understand and model the carbon transition. So how do we understand the many different ways that the world is going to decarbonize and the different speeds at which it will move. So when we move to different energy mixes in the world, it's very important for financing that everybody is aligned and goes in the same direction. And finally, with the changing climate conditions, as we see um, increased um, cases of uh, extreme weather events, droughts, wildfires, heat waves, and then an emergence of chronic risk with um, average, average you know, rising sea levels, average temperature levels rising. We felt also that we need to help financial institutions understand that risk and also see if we can use that understanding into, to bring a new type of resilience finance products into the industry. And I'm, I'm currently now fully seconded to OS Climate from the bank until uh, April next year. Great. Uh, my name is Chris Shea. Uh, I'm the head of open source uh, strategy at uh, FutureWay. Um, so my background is uh, a software engineer uh, by training. And uh, uh, we're coming from ICT industry, uh, internet communication technology. Uh, my work uh, at FutureWay is mostly focusing on uh, strategic uh, open source uh, challenges. Uh, when we talk about strategy, uh, it, to us it really means landscape, the uh, forward-looking uh, challenges, and the trend. Uh, so th these are things we are looking at. So um, uh, from our SD perspective, uh, we're looking at, uh, uh, one of the things that we're uh, looking at is the global uh, challenges on open source, uh, especially in, at this time, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, geopolitical challenges. And uh, on the vertical side, we realize that uh, uh, energy is a very important uh, challenge. There's a lot of applications uh, for ICT that side. Uh, there's also uh, uh, a lot of uh, opportunities uh, from how we can rethink uh, energy, uh, energy uh, production and uh, consumption. So those are things that are very upcoming 
emerging uh, uh, things that we think about a lot uh, every day. Uh, so we feel like uh, we can uh, help contribute in that uh, evolution of energy and also uh, be help, help contribute to the, um, the SDG goals of the United Nations. And hopefully uh, through our contribution, uh, working with collaborators, uh, we can collectively uh, achieve those uh, SDG goals. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Um, so we've, I've chunked out this session into a few different topics, and I was thinking we would start with energy sustainability, which relates back to SDG 7, which is affordable and clean energy. Um, and so, Kate, first question for you. Um, so in the report, and actually uh, what you just mentioned in, in, the in your introduction, you spoke about Zephyr's inception as being a response to the massive energy needs of the Linux kernel. And I was wondering if you could give us some examples um, of why this small energy footprint is important in the context of some specific use cases that Zephyr is in. So Zephyr is very much designed to have be able to work when you don't have access to being plugged into something. And so you're seeing Zephyr in things like devices that are used for tracking um, temperature of, as products move through the supply chain to keep, make sure that a vaccine doesn't go above a certain temperature threshold or that the food stays within a temperature range when it is being shipped to market. Um, we have examples of trackers like this already for Zephyr, for Zephyr out in the field as well as you know, devices for tracking where your dog is in the neighborhood or your cat is in the neighborhood. So these things are, have to last for a long time. Like you, want, you don't want to be charging something every day, and sometimes you want it for a week. Right now, there's an actually an electrical grid monitor that's done with Zephyr that they check, the, check on it, the battery for it lasts for 10 years, OK? And you want to basically be, if you're tracking animals, you don't want to be changing the tag, the ear tags on them or the, um, cow, the equivalent of an electric cowbell on them. So we have devices and products out in the field today that are doing these types of tasks. As well as you're seeing Zephyr and things like the uh, energy grid for um, like the Libra Solar project um, has been around for a couple of years and it basically creates a microgrid and they're using Zephyr in that to go from the solar panels to the home systems. There's reference examples out there of AC monitoring, DC monitoring, and we know that it's already in wind turbines. And so it's sitting inside embedded in wind turbines. So things that have to last um, out in the field, it's becoming a really good solution for those types of applications and helping with the sustainability and the efficiency. Thanks. Chris, I'm looking at you because I heard the word microgrids. And yes. Chris and I worked on, uh, along with a bunch of other members of the LF Energy community and research community, on a research project on microgrids. I'm wondering if you have a follow-up to what Kate's just talked about. Yes, actually, uh, Zephyr project is a kind of typical example of how ICT engage uh, and uh, provide value to the energy system. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, she, she's talking about IoT. Right? IoT will makes use of a lot of uh, uh, connections, internet connections, mobile networks, 5G networks. Because you're going you're gonna to do these remote places, mm -hmm. and those remote places need the uh, real waves to get the signals back. And all of those are built on top of uh, yeah, 5G and those uh, 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 private networking solutions that ICT companies, industries provide. So uh, from our point of view, uh, we're working from an ICD perspective, we're uh, looking at more of a holistic way of doing things. Meaning, uh, networking side, we have a networking protocol called the network uh, carbon intensity. Network, it's basically evaluating the, uh, the networking side of carbon emissions, try to reduce that carbon emission, so that it provides a way for uh, telecom operators or uh, manufacturers uh, a way to measure their con uh, carbon efficiency of their equipment. And also holistically, we have networking side, we also have a compute side. On the compute side, we're working, uh, we engage with, uh, I think this uh, GSM, GSF, Green Software Foundation, on um, defining the uh, software carbon emission uh, uh, specification. Those contribute to the software contribution of uh, carbon efficiencies. And uh, on the uh, other side, we're also looking at how we can continue to improve that to provide more like a more of a holistic way, meaning that you have a standard and, and the, and the uh, individual uh, uh, vendors can, uh, can uh, apply those standards 
in their uh, application development or, or, or develop, uh, pro deployment. So we're doing this more of a holistic view uh, to address that uh, energy problem. And then we have a, a vertical project that's an open source microgrid that will address uh, the fundamentally the energy uh, uh, production, uh, more, more efficient, uh, carbon efficient production of energy. So that's why we have this uh, open source uh, microgrid project. So, yeah, so we're trying to attract the, uh, attack this issue from uh, multiple uh, approaches uh, with a, a systematic uh, uh, approach. So that's our uh, way to do this. Thanks. Yeah. So just kind of picking up on the, the concept of approaching a problem holistically, um, I'd like to turn to Sumer at this point. Um, and we were just speaking earlier today about how AgStack looks at really, really big problems. I mean, you just mentioned today the stats on um, the agricultural sector. Um, so I was wondering if, um, you know, in the report, AgStack's focus is on open data. Um, can you elaborate on the types of data needed in the agriculture sector to advance these really um, large issues and solutions to them, and what AgStack is doing to address these data needs? Sure. Um, so it's really a mind-blowing, sort of uh, dizzying array of uh, challenges in the agriculture sector. The food supply chain is, is massive and ubiquitous because you know we all need to eat. Uh, and we don't really think about it, but every time you grow food, when you pump water to uh, irrigate your field, or when you apply fertilizer, those fertilizer has a energy payload and a carbon payload that goes onto the field. When you transport food, when you refrigerate food, when you package food, when you do anything to food along the supply chain, global supply chains, you're expanding energy. And so, because a third of the food is wasted and a third of the people are hungry, it's a massively wasteful ecosystem today. I mean, in any other sector, I used to work in the semiconductor sector, if we found 1% efficiency, that was like a massive benefit. So some of the examples that we see, one of the projects we're working on is called a Field Carbon Model Project, where we're trying to quantify the carbon flux on an agriculture field, and we have three levels of precision. One is completely remotely sensed, which is data pipelines from satellites and weather feeds. Uh, and, and work that has been done over the last decades by scientists all over the world. The second level of that is in-field instrumentation, where we actually see soil moisture and soil temperature uh, measurements, and that directly connects to things like Zephyr uh, uh, devices that can provide that input to quantify the field carbon flux. And the third level is actually activity modeling, where the activities themselves, like applying fertilizer or applying a pesticide, or doing pest management where you're actually predicting what pests are going to manifest based on weather data sets. All of these are actually public information. The models of how to do this the science is already there. The data that, that that model needs to compute for a given field is also still there. What is not there is the middleware, is essentially how do you make that model, that data accessible to the global south? You know, the half the world's labor force that's working in agriculture, they're not working in, you know, the global north. They're working in the global south. How do you make that accessible to them in ways that are that is inclusive, is very much protective of their privacy? So things like data wallets, uh, you know, that comes into play in, in sharing information from farmers and back and forth. There's an entire regulatory framework that Europe has launched called the European deforestation regulation, which requires coffee growers, for example, or many other commodities, to actually share their data. How are they going to do so? And if you cannot share where they grow the food, they can actually be prohibited from exporting coffee into Europe, which is, by the way, the largest coffee market in the world. So the implications are so massive, and this is such an important field, it's just that we are so detached from our food production nowadays that we just don't understand that this is actually an existential and very important topic. Part of what we are trying to do is really engage with the entire ecosystem of LF, not just AgStack, but all the ecosystem you know, projects like OS Climate, like Zephyr and others, to really bring to the forefront the opportunities for us to really build a future supply chain for food that is more sustainable, both in energy and in nutrition. And you know, to build on that, there's actually reference examples that are out there today 
of, you know, here's how you do a soil moisture monitor. So there's public reference examples that people can go access exactly. devices from and then put them in the field in an efficient way and then using the communication and cap capability that's in those in Zephyr things to communicate to some centralized hub to pull the data onto a phone line and ship it somewhere. Yeah, and you know, to that point, the ESG practices of large CPG companies, you know, big brands, for example, they have supply chains where they're getting food from like 100 countries. How do you get the same moisture and sense, you know, temperature sensor even manufactured and available to farmers across 100 countries? And you do that through open source. You do that through standardization. You do that through the, the widgets that we know how to build and maintain in a pre-competitive way such that this ecosystem can really transition to the next economy. And when you are actually in the field, it's a very resource constraint. So you want solar to potentially power your device right. in order to pull this stuff forward. And so, like I say, there's many dimensions where we have to be efficient and effective. And as we pull this, as we create these technologies and make them able to scale, um, you know, that's a challenge. And that's quite frankly making sure we can share them all with people so that we can make awareness there that these things exist already. And then hopefully other people will gather together and help refine and enhance them too. Yes, I say, I say uh, put all these IoT devices out there in the field, in the mountains, in the, in the large field. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the, uh, the devices that need to power itself using solar. I mean, actually, uh, I, I know that uh, some company that do this in Himalayas mm -hmm. with a five feet station with a power antenna. And that's why we uh, promote the, the NCI standard, which is a network carbon uh, intensity standard, trying to basically do the zero, uh, zero watts, zero bits. Uh, if, uh, if there's no communication, they just shut itself down. If their communication powers up, to get the efficiency of that uh, telecom equipment, of uh, 5G base station. Yeah. Um, another example I'm aware of um, in this upper ecosystem is they put tags on reindeer up in the um, Scandinavian countries that are running Zephyr and communicating with satellite to track the animals. But then it's efficient and effective because if the wolves prey on the reindeer, they get insurance. And so because they get insurance, the herders are actually motivated to tag the animals and track them. So that, and that sort of helps pay for the tagging and the technology infrastructure. Yeah. And that's there today. Yeah, I think one thing that I want to mention, which is like we have this um, kind of a little bit of a bias for the tech ecosystem we know, yeah. which is good, which is very good and it's needed. But there's also a huge amount of information, just pure data that could be used to make better decisions. So for example, what crop should a farmer grow, right? It doesn't have to be some of the farmers for price, for incomes. Those are the SDG goals, poverty. Those are SDG goals. So what, what crop should a farmer grow? That's information about demand cycles, about pricing. What crop should the farmer grow for a better soil, not just for income? And these choices and decisions are all done in the absence of good information. And so a lot of this is not just about uh, you know, hardware devices and IoT, that's a big part of it, but it's also about just better decisions along the supply chain by practitioners and not just farmers either, all through the supply chain. And there's a huge amount of risk management, for example, that could be done around these decisions for farmers and upstream you know, in their supply chain. Yeah, Matt, can we hear from you? And I see you nodding a lot, and I know this is relevant to what OS Climate is doing. Yeah, I mean, what we've just heard is, um, is a problem that the financial community has got on a scale of, uh, of you know, hundreds of thousands or millions because they're lending and investing in, uh, in many different assets and companies around the world. So really the, the problem is that we need to geocode the metadata of the entire globe. Um, for example, describing those carbon footprints, those supply chain dynamics, and um, so we can make the right decisions around where those investment portfolios lend. And those decisions also have to be forward looking because we need to understand CapEx commitments and strategies around uh, where footprints are today in companies, but where they will be in the future. Um, when you combine that with all the other data we've just described and heard about with, with macroeconomic data, different scenario pathways, different climate hazard data describing floods, wildfires and the work likes. Uh, we're talking about a significant amount of data coming from a significant number of different sources. So we will never have a single golden source to solve this problem. Um, we don't want a gigantic data lake, um, for sure. 
Um, so the, um, the approach that OS Climate um, took um, in a project led by Red Hat was to, um, to build a data mesh architecture to handle this, um, the delivery of data to the users that need it. And that's the aggregation of data from the multiple different sources. Uh, so speaking from a non-tech person, what I can tell you is the way I consider that mesh is it's a data federation um, approach, which means that you are federating data from multiple sources rather than actually copying it and storing it centrally. Um, this um, brings many advantages in terms of the way the data governance is managed because the primary core data governance is held at source. Um, and then the, uh, the providers of the data can then make a selection as to how and where that data is shared. So obviously the more open data, the better, the more it, become, it becomes trusted, and which is we, all, we want to make decisions that are transparent and trusted. Um, so that's, um, that's obviously a, a key thing, but there may be cases where we need to share data from supply chain um, to end, end to start of supply chain. There may be cases where uh, a lender needs to share money, uh, share data with an investor. So how, uh, the way to do that is to, is to use a data federation uh, approach. So um, that's the mesh architecture. The, um, uh, what we also like about it is that the fact that um, I've kind of hinted on it, two things. You can actually combine commercial data then with a public data model. So we expect the amount of public and open data to grow over time, but we will never solve the entire problem of the world with just public data. Uh, the second brilliant thing about this mesh context is that it's data agnostic, uh, which means it's also attracting the attention of the biodiversity and nature community. So um, uh, we're hoping that through discussions with, um, uh, with that community, they may be able to take this completely open source blueprint of a mesh and apply it to, to solve the, uh, the biodiversity and nature crisis that we're also heading into. Yeah, and so again, the technology is trying to help here as well in the biodiversity side where we've got a lot of endangered species out there right now and we've got a lot of poachers. And so one of the recent use cases we learned about um, from Zephyr is basically implanting trackers into rhino horns and they've actually been able to catch a poacher and basically are pro able to prosecute. Um, so being able to track the animals, being able to help um, with the very limited resources that some of these parks have is um, we're starting to see some of that start to take off. Um, we're also seeing it like, you know, the, you know, a wider range in domestic animals and, you know, in areas that don't have fences and, you know, in detection and so forth. But these things are all part of the story. Absolutely. May I? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of top off what uh, Kate said around herd management. You know, in agriculture, you have massive herds of animals. People are managing from two buffaloes in a household to just herds of entire massive, massive herds. So, you know, in milk production, for example, there's a big need for managing the health of the cow. You know, people don't really realize that milk comes from cows and and that cow's health, you know, it's not a factory, it's a it's a it's an animal and you know, she needs to lactate and the, the health of that animal and tracking the health. And so not, now some of the large CPG companies are creating, trying to, but I think they could benefit from an open source architecture and standard methodologies to create, you know, uh, the, 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 the bio cycles of the cow and what nutrition does a cow need at what stage of the life to ensure the milk production is actually healthy. Um, and, you know, there's hundreds of millions of farmers who are basically depending on that cow to be healthy so that the milk can be produced. Then the milk itself, did you know that one third of the milk production in India is actually goes right down the drain within 24 hours of milking? Do you know that the actual carbon footprint of milk is so huge because you have to grow the crop to feed the cow to then get the cow to a pregnancy state, have the calf, then the lactation starts. It's just incredible how, how much effort. And then why? No refrigeration. Why? Because there's not enough sensors, enough, not electricity. There's a lot of pieces to this puzzle that we have the solutions to. And I think an open source architecture provides these Lego blocks for the entire you know, ecosystem, entire supply chains of these large companies who are sourcing milk, for example, across herds, across huge geographic regions. Yeah, so the, I mean, we're, we're coming up to maybe asking some audience questions, but I'd love to get everyone's um, opinion kind of around that topic of this 
as you mentioned earlier, this pre-competitive state that is being built by these, um, these LEGO blocks or these, these projects that can support this kind of collaboration um, before you get to the more kind of competitive state. Um, and maybe tying that into why open source in particular is so important for these really big sustainability crises that, that we're facing. Um, maybe start, you're holding the mic. Yeah, I'm start? happy to start. Okay. Um, from the person that knew very little about open source a few years ago, I can probably tell you how, how remarkable it really is. Um, fundamentally, the, um, the great thing is, is sharing in the pre-competitive work because in the example, everything we've just talked about, 90% you know, or 80 to 90% of the problem uh, sits in the, in the pre-competitive space. There's no intellectual property for a bank to build its own climate model, for example. Um, so, so we can collaborate. And if you get, if you hire a data scientist to try to come up with a really important project to help climate or, or biodiversity, they're going to spend 90% of their time trying to structure data, collect it, work out a lab environment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas they can share that load through open source, and um, and, and, and it's a very agile way of, of oper operating, in fact, as well. So you can go much faster. And then the the the, the wonderful thing on top of that is that when you then bring in commercial providers and commercial operators that are going to build services on top of the platform, if they can all collaborate together at the pre-competitive layer to build common codes and common standards, getting people talking about the problem with a common language, then you can create much more interesting products and commerce on top of the open layer. So, so I'm a convert for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the examples I wanted to give was for a large CPG company that's trying to source, uh, you know, uh, food, raw supply of food from uh, 100 countries. And one of the unique challenges they have without having access to open source is they can't get the same products manufactured, the same standards actually even implemented um, by keeping it in a proprietary stack. So it's not just a nice to have, it's a necessity for these companies to essentially invest in open source and not just one project, but many of the sub projects so that their solutions can be quick, but really their solutions can even be possible. So I just wanted to emphasize that some of the things aren't even possible without open source because you cannot manufacture the same sensor, for example, in 16 different designs, all doing basically a non-proprietary thing uh, and expect the answers to be all consistent. It just doesn't happen. Just physically po impossible. Chris, yeah? yeah I think uh, another aspect of uh, what the question of why open source is uh, uh, helpful for sustainability development, sustainable development, uh, from the, I think open source is represent a, a public good. Uh, sustainable development is very much aligned in terms of the mindset, in terms of vision, in terms of ideas. So open source is, a, I think, is a natural home for sustainable development. Uh, practically, open source is a, a very good go-to-market. Uh, it's a very good democratization mechanism, right? If you build a proprietary solution, yes, you, you control everything, but uh, nowadays you want to have, a, you intend to have a mass adoption of your solution and the business model uh, has evolved and changed. Uh, so open source is, uh, is a very advantageous way, especially for sustainable development uh, product and solutions. And one of the challenges though with open source is the fact that you don't know all the places where it's actually being used. And so some of the things that can be actually done to help open source projects is to let them know that you are using them so that they can inspire other people to do similar sorts of things as well so we can get the scale. And then I guess on that note, if someone has a product that they're running Zephyr right now on that they can come tell me about afterwards, I have some kites with Zephyr and I'm happy to give them, if they can point me at a product that um, I don't know about already, I would love to give them a kite because that helps the Zephyr project and helps people understand how this is all being used and being able to tell these stories. It does help, with the, it does help these projects and it does help the rest of us as well. 
Can I make one more point? Um, just for the, from a perspective of messaging to private sector companies to become members and supporters of open source, I wanted to emphasize one thing, that when we say open source or the free software, the free part is not gratis, it's libre. We are talking about freedom of operating and freedom of, of yes, we are not talking about all this stuff is necessarily free. It, takes money and time and people's effort to build and maintain open source. So members should not feel that they can continue to get benefits without putting in money into memberships. It's a fraction, a very small fraction, particularly for SDG goals. And, and I think it's just such a understated thing that most people in open source don't say enough about. So I just thought I'd say it because it's so silly. Everybody thinks open source is free. Oh, you just get it. The free part is freedom, not gratis. And it happens to also be given away because we want to have freedom. And, and we also want to share and be able to build on what each other's does. But yeah, there is an infrastructure and in helping to keep these projects sustainable and available. Yeah. Uh, especially with what's going on here in Europe with the CRA, is definitely one of the interesting challenges that we are facing as an open source community. So um, I would also tie it back to, um, if you want to be keeping open source available in the same models it's available today, um, you know, so get involved yes. in making your voice heard that you do want to keep using open source because if uh, developers um, are being held liable um, for things outside of their, like you know, people over in Asia or North America, um, are contributing to these projects worldwide, which is where we need the solutions. But if it's suddenly we can't use it in Europe, then um, you know we can't sell to Europe. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, really going to hurt open source. So I think we only have four minutes. Um, I don't know if that's right. I think we only have. I think we go till three twenty. So if there's an audience question, we'd love to take it. Um, if not, any final thoughts? But I'll, I'll let it percolate a bit in the audience. There you go. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Kate. Um, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, it was really insightful. Um, so as a, as a young engineer, um, where do I get started? <laughs> so um, I, it was really nice to listen to all the things that uh, you said, you know, and uh, I would really like to contribute, but I don't know where to get started mm -hmm. because there was a lot of problems, but I don't know, <laughs> um, you know, who, who has to provide the solution, yeah. So I'm gonna chime in there. Um, oops. I'll quickly chime in on that, even though I just finished moving the mic over there. Um, get involved with one of the projects here. That's the first step. So if one of these is speaking to your heart and things that you care about in your space, um, start working with that project and making contributions up to that project and download it. Well, first download the project and, you know, like say you wanna write an irrigation system into your garden or something like that, that's meaningful to you. There's pieces out there, there's reference examples out there. Start with those, build on them. And then if you get a better idea, contribute it up. And there's always people looking for, um, you know, right now in some of these communities, um, there's corporations that are hiring people and they'll look for evidence that you can contribute upstream so that helps with your career too. Yeah, no, I, I just want to sort of echo what uh, Kate just said. A um, Couple of different ways. One way is what Kate just mentioned, just get involved, reach out to the people in the open source community that you like, whatever project you like. Another way is to actually think about the solution and start building things. Just on your own time, just, you know, think about that's how we all got started, really. Um, and so you start building things and you sort of see roadblocks. And you say, oh, you know, I don't know how to do this. And then reach out to that particular project and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm building this in open source. I want to contribute. How do you do this? And that's a very tangible way to get sucked into a community because they, they'll be like, oh, cool. Here's another person who's crazy enough like us to build things. And, and, and that's, I, I find that to be very useful. And there's a third way, which is be an activist for your organization. If you're working in your college or university, if you're working in a, in a, in a, in a business, uh, if you're working in a nonprofit, in a, in a government organization, be an activist, be a voice, say, how, why, why don't we do this in open source? Why do we have to invent this? Why, you know, so just the, be that way, and I think you can get involved in many different ways. 
I fully agree with all of that. And obviously, the uh, maybe a good starting point is also the uh, the LF uh, report. That's uh, I don't know if that's come out this morning or if it's about to be. Uh, the button is yeah. about to be pushed on it yeah. because you have a. Uh, a, a comprehensive list of all the LF projects that are contributing to the different SDGs because it's obviously nice to do something with purpose. Right. And if not, come to our website, os-climate.org, and uh, there's plenty to be done there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, first is to identify a project uh, that uh, you will be, uh, uh, your, that align with your interest. And I would suggest to work on some more of this kind of uh, uh, sustainability-related projects because that will also uh, put your, uh, you know, if you are looking for a new job or something, and, and uh, the hiring manager say, oh, this person not only is skillful and their own engineering role, but he, he got, she got a, a, a good heart. And she got a very good attitude towards you know, this uh, uh, charitable uh, organizations or you know, or the, the open source uh, project, especially in the uh, sustainable uh, development uh, projects. So that give a good uh, uh, another aspect of yourself uh, to the hiring manager. So you know, I have a 14 year old daughter, so she asked me what to do and I said, maybe uh, Green Solar Foundation has a hackathon. Maybe you can join that hackathon. Right, and showcase the result of the hackathon to your friend and, and your student or teacher. Right? See, that puts a lot, that says a lot about your own excuse, uh, skills and your, uh, your other aspects that hiring managers are looking for. So, and also look for a good mentor. Mm. And there are a lot of mentor, uh, in the, a good mentor in the open source organization and projects. Um, yeah, do we have time for another question? I don't know who, yes, we do. Okay, fabulous. Um, I think I saw one. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I guess the mic. Uh, yeah. Just speak up, yeah. Just speak up, maybe you read the question. Yeah, no, we can hear you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you very much, panel, for the, the interesting discussion. There's one question I had because there's a great diverse uh, panelist from different foundations working on the sustainable goal and also wondering how can your efforts help one another in, mm. in the goals you achieve? That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a very, very good question. <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, I'll, I'll start with my own personal view on this and then sort of echo this, that it is not just unique to me. The Linux Foundation I find is like a, a house of Lego blocks. And you can start to create things with those Lego blocks. And you know, AgStack maybe one block, and then you know, Zephyr is another block, and OS Climate is another block. And we can build different things with those blocks. And there are 900 projects at the Linux Foundation. And you know, so I think the the way to do this is more meetups and more. Uh, questions with each other and 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 asking discussions in the hallway. Yeah, it, it and and, so we, very, and it's already happening. I mean, we are we are engaged with projects which involve Hyperledger, which we are starting to build a project uh, with 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 Kate on soil moisture testing, with OS Climate on mm -hmm. ag uh, field carbon. There is no reason at all why we should be jealous about our project. We're all trying to build great projects, but they're in the ecosystem of like creating solutions for private sector to build on top of. So there's plenty of opportunity. Uh, yeah. It's quite stunning, actually. But, you know, you can't do everything, right? So you basically create your, you know, your borders, your boundaries, your Lego blocks, and say, oh, I've got this block here, or I've got this technology here, but I want a solution. And oh, there's a solution stack sitting over here. Can we put all this stuff together and make it as a reference so others can build on it. And so like we're doing that type of thing in the Elisa project for safety. But you know, um, and then we know of um, a startups and so forth that are doing things for the soil moisture. And so they're using Zephyr and some of these technologies. So working with um, some of our members, working with other people in the community who want to make these things all work together, um, it's a lot of fun actually, yeah, it, it is. really is. And so it really is. Uh, interacting with, and with, with not just in the LF, but with other open source projects. Correct. It's important as, as well, like the Libra Solar project. I learned about um, from an LF Energy talk, and they were talking about how they did these microgrids in Africa using Zephyr. Yeah, and Apache so, Foundation. We, right? we use their code all the time. Yeah. So. And, and so, you know, we 
need to, you know, work beyond boundaries to some extent, but there's a lot of technologies and just, you know, learning about each other and making things visible. Um, it really helps everyone. It's all pre-competitive. That's why there's no boundaries, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> one more. Time, okay, so uh, maybe come ask us at the end of the session, yeah. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.